broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, welcome everyone. Um, we are super excited today for auction event day survival webinar. Ooh, we're trying something different here. We're gonna shake it up to start 2020. Uh, we are going webcam. Um, so welcome to my office in Chicago. And Jason, um, welcome, welcome to Jason's to office. office. Oh, welcome to my office in Sarasota, Florida. And we're still waiting for Melissa, who's having some technical difficulties getting on the webinar. So hopefully she'll be on soon. If not, we're just going to, we're all auction experts here and we'll go ahead and um, keep covering. But while we're waiting and before we get started, why don't I just do some light housekeeping? Um, Blair, if you want to go ahead and advance to the next slide. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with One Cause, we get a ton of different people. Um, you're like, who's talking to me today and what are they going to talk about? What's their frame of reference? Um, we used to be BidPal. We're now One Cause, full suite of mobile fundraising and online fundraising products. Uh, really, we measure what we do in the success that we're able to help nonprofits raise more money, reach more donors. One of the great things I get to do here is um, have other partners join us in the webinar. So with that, Jason, why don't you talk a little bit about Winspire and, and your experience? Perfect. Kelly, thanks. We really enjoy our partnership with One Cause and are able to help raise a lot of money for multiple organizations around the country. And at Winspire, you know, our mission is to help organizations raise funds. Um, our highly sought after bucket list travel experiences um, definitely turn into real dollars. Um, these are one of a kind type experiences that really we offer a white glove service. And just to kind of give you guys some volume on how we handle this, we sent almost 13,000 people on trips last year. It's pretty amazing. That is awesome. And so let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. And I believe Melissa's on the phone and she'll join us in just a second. Uh, let me also, for those that are joining, first of all, welcome. Uh, lots to cover today. I know it's the beginning of gala season. Um, so for those of you in the crunch time, hopefully we can share some practical tips with you. For those of you doing fall fundraising and summer fundraising, hopefully we get you ahead of the game um, to relieve a little bit of the stress. Uh, we will record this webinar. So afterwards, we'll send both the slides and the audio recording. So really just sit back, relax, have a glass of water, have a cup of coffee, have a cocktail if you want, um, but really just try to engage and absorb. So with that, before I turn it over to Melissa, I always like to encourage people, we will take questions throughout. Um, we'll make time at the end for questions, but if you can go ahead and if you have questions, um, go ahead and put them in the question bar. I'd like to always start to make sure that you can tell me where are you calling in from right now? Um, and what is the weather like? I'm <laughs> calling from Chicago and it's snowing and it's 32. Jason, where are you calling in from? Um, I'm calling in from Sarasota, Florida, and we had winter yesterday and today it was in the 50s, but now we're back up to 75, so it's over. We're good. That's awesome. Who, who else is out there? Where are you from? Melissa, are you on? I am on and I am in uh, today, very cloudy Charleston, South Carolina. Awesome. Uh, we got Lou in California at 68 degrees. Anybody else out there want to tell us where they are? All right. We got Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, it's cold, y'all. Thank you, Caitlin, Marcy, um, and Jessica in Battleground, uh, Washington. It's rainy there. We got Julie in Cleveland, Ohio, cold but sunny. We got Nashville, my favorite place. Um, it's freezing, Larissa, I'm sorry, it's freezing here too. Sunny Connecticut, Monica, Seattle, Washington, Jazz. Oh, Jazz, you're on a lot of our webinars. Atlanta, Georgia, Janet, uh, Kim's in Bellingham, Washington. We got, oh, Fresno, California, Danny, I'm from Fresno. I grew up there, fifth generation Californian. Um, so thank you, all of you, oh my gosh, so many um, from all around the country. It looks like every state here. So now we know your question bar works. No reason not to use it for the rest of the webinar. And with that, I'm going to stop talking. Um, you'll hear me throughout, maybe post questions for both of our hosts. But Melissa, why don't you kick it off? Talk a little bit about um, yourself and then Jason, and then I'll share some stats to get us underway. Okay, perfect. Well, I am Melissa Merriam. I am the Senior Director of Consulting and Customer Education. That's a mouthful. Here at One Cause, uh, I've been with One Cause. Um, I just passed my nine year anniversary. So obviously I love it here. I love our customers and um, all those people that are on the webinar that are not currently customers. Hopefully you'll become one. 
um, because we do love our customers. Um, I love what I do. Uh, basically, my role is to lead the team that helps our customers get prepared for their events. Um, so we share best practices, um, advise them on ways to raise more revenue, engage in better ways with their donors, and hopefully have a less stressful um, event day. So um, I'm very passionate about fundraisers and fundraising in general, and I would say probably my favorite aspect of fundraising events um, is probably the donation appeal. Um, I also run the peer-to-peer -peer consulting engagements as well here at One Cause, so we're super excited about that software and all of the great things that it can do. Great. Take awesome. it away, Jason. Um, I'm Jason Champion. I'm the Director of Product Development and Creative Director at Winspire. So I am the one that gets to test all of these amazing products that you see on our website to make sure that they are delivered to your donors and have a first class experience. Um, I've been in the nonprofit world for a little over a decade. And, you know, my favorite saying out of all of this and all the time is $50 is $50. Let's go raise it. <laughs> Dollars a dollars a dollar. So let's talk about how we can maximize that and help all of you, you know, survive the upcoming auction season. Before we kick off, we'll go to the next slide. I wanted to give you a reference point. So we did a study last year called a social donor study where we talked to 1,056 donors who had recently given either to an event or a peer-to-peer -peer campaign. And we asked them what was important to them, what motivated them, why did they give, why did they keep coming back? And so to set the context here, before we dive into auctions, we wanted to share this data again. It's surprising what these thousand donors told us in the events is the top things that motivate them, as you can see in the blue there, you know, it's a good location that the community is involved in the event, food and a compelling program casual isn't always what we think look at those volunteers oftentimes we spend a lot of time thinking about our bars and our celebrity guests and uh, are we formal enough and do we have the best band out there uh, we will share these slides after you'll have them but keep these these motivators in mind um, as you begin to think about your next auction and what the priorities are for those that actually attend them okay and that one more little tidbit we wanted to share is what else did event donors tell us as we're starting to talk about this, that, you know, auction and auction survival, that 67% of them have donated to the charity before. This is important because in the world of first time donors and when we make decisions about, you know, who's new and who's repeat at our events, it's very um, compelling to know that the vast majority of people coming to your events have interacted with your nonprofit before. You are catering to people familiar with your cause. Keep that in the center of your decision making. Um, and how do they donate? Uh, we see this, which is startling for us, that they're still donating a lot through cash or check or in person um, versus making their purchases online. So again, as we configure and we talk about some of the challenges um, and optimal best practices around registration and checkout, keep that in mind. You still have to account for those people who are doing their transactions on site. Uh, they were our largest donors, 382 was the average donation to an event, the median 100. Um, and again, how familiar are these people? The majority are very familiar with your cause or somewhat familiar. So keeping this data in mind as we start to talk about what experiences are we creating at our auctions? How do we survive them? But how do we also make them not just survivable, but thrivable for our guests as well? So with that, Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Melissa, why don't you take it away and give an overview timeline and then we'll actually jump into the meat of the webinar. Absolutely. Um, so we, um, the vast majority of our clients are meeting kind of these really great milestones, starting your early planning for the event about 12 to nine months in advance, um, creating your fundraising strategy. Obviously that for many nonprofits is woven into your culture and really in every single thing that you do um, should have the backbone of your fundraising strategy. So hopefully it's not too difficult to come up with a specific fundraising strategy for a specific event, whether it's to fund a capital project or um, operating expenses or whatever that might be. Um, you have to make sure that obviously you have your end goal in sight um, and what what will make this event successful. What's that success metric? Um, promoting your auction. Um, of course, you know, nowadays, obviously social media is a great way to promote your auction. We talked a little bit about our peer-to-peer -peer software. We've got many customers that are starting to integrate 
a pre-event ambassador fundraising campaign, basically taking your most ardent supporters and having them really help promote your event and your auction um, prior to the day that it happens. Um, and really, you know, connecting with previous donors, as we mentioned, about 67% of people had given before. Um, so that's a natural, you know, low hanging fruit place to start. Um, and then of course, I'm thinking about corporate sponsorships and promoting through um, corporate endeavors is definitely important. Um, execution, this is an area when that many people um, might put on the back burner and start to think about it closer to their event and have gone down a road that maybe they don't really want to go to. So we find that successful execution is top of mind from the very beginning stages. And then at this point, two to one month before your event, you're really just buttoning up the details, right? Dotting your I's, crossing your T's. And then uh, go time, <laughs> the most important day, right? The fruits of your efforts. Um, so on that day, you really don't want to be doing any sort of planning, fixing mistakes. We always encourage our customers to have everything wrapped up you know, three to five days in advance. Don't be adding any items. Don't, you know, try not to be removing guests and adding guests. Um, you know, really try and say to, say to your supporters, your volunteers, we have a finite deadline. It's this day, and we don't want to go either past that or, or before that, obviously. Great. So what we're going to do with this timeline is actually break it down to each one of these stages. We're going to give you foundational information for those experts out there. Probably nothing new that you haven't thought about before, but you'll hear a little bit of a different take on it from both Jason and Melissa. Uh, and then we're going to try to give a pro tip. One thing I asked both Jason and Melissa, think about the one thing you wish you would have known, either at an event that went really well or a total disaster, um, and share their pro tips. So with that, Blair, let's go ahead and uh, forward and jump right in. All right, okay. Melissa. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so here, right here, we're going to talk about our early planning phase, which is about 12 to nine months out from your event. Um, obviously, number one, we want to know how much we have to spend on the event. Um, we want to make sure that we're reverse engineering back to, um, so there are metrics that you can use in planning silent auctions specifically, as well as live auctions, but um, basically taking your total value of your auction. Um, you know, let's nice round number, let's say it's $40,000. Um, when you have a $40,000 auction, with mobile bidding, um, paper bid sheets have an average about 35% revenue, and that's revenue to value of the auction. So for a $40,000 auction, you'd see, um, I don't know, what the, I'm not going to just math, but um, uh, four times three, so around $15,000. With mobile bidding, our customers see somewhere upwards of 65%, 75%. So if you're going to see a 65% um, revenue on a $40,000 value, well, then you can reverse engineer that, right? I want to raise $25,000. Well, then I need, you know, X dollars in revenue. So think about that when you set your budget. Um, obviously, you want to plan on, you know, how many people you're going to have, set your goals, um, and then obviously selecting your venue. It's so important to select your venue. If you know you're going to be using technology, Make that part of your venue requirements and questions that you ask about. You want to have good Wi-Fi. You want to have cell service. Um, these are things that sometimes we end up connecting with people a little bit closer to their event, and you know they hadn't thought about that. Their event is in a basement surrounded by cement walls. We deal with this a lot in New York City. Um, so then there are obviously more costs involved in getting the technologies you need. So definitely really focus on that. If you know you're going to integrate technology, be sure that's part of your venue survey. Um, your auction team, super, super important to have not only your loyal staff members, but also those volunteers. Um, volunteers really are going to be part of the lifeblood of this event. And you want people that are sharp, that um, are friendly, um, not too friendly. <laughs> we don't want them to hold up people at registration, but um, definitely get an auction team that works well together. That's, and, you know, um, there, there are teams that work well together, and then there are other teams that don't. So make sure your team works well together, and there's a lot of good, healthy respect, and, um, and that you have people with creative ideas and that are reliable. Um, identifying sponsors is absolutely so important. Um, I think there's a major kind of push um, socially on, on corporations to be a little bit more um, sensitive to, you know, the things that are going on in the world and be good stewards of the funds that they've, they've raised. Um, so I think it's very important to connect with sponsors, um, and I think there's more openness to it now than ever. Um, you know, they really want to be seen as a company that does good. So um, that certainly works well for nonprofit organizations. 
And then when you're thinking about procurement, pro, I always have t- trouble with this word, I'm sorry, procurement, um, you definitely want to go back to that, what I talked about in number one, really get down into the metrics, be scientific about it, get a, a nice range of items so that you have things to offer every person that comes to the event. When you do have a lot of corporate sponsors, don't forget, you're going to have some unknown folks that are going to show up at the event, um, and you're going to have all different socioeconomic levels. So um, definitely make sure that you have a good, a good spread of items for um, the people that will be there. And I think is my pro yes, my pro tip is next. Um, and hey, unfortunately, Melissa, just I can't, real quick, yeah, real quick. Um, we're getting some uh, comments that your audio is going in and out. So if you maybe move that mic closer to your um, headset, that'd be great. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Much better. Hopefully that okay. helps everybody out there. Uh, Blair, go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Melissa, your pro tip was procurement, individual and special item strategies. Why don't you explain that real quick? And then I want to get Jason in here too, because Jason, I know you're a firm believer in early planning. The earlier, the better. But Melissa, why don't you share your pro tip? What do you mean by procurement, individual and special item strategies? Yes. So what I meant by that, and I sort of, I guess, spoiled my pro tip because I sort of wove it into the bullet points that we spoke of in the previous slide. So as I mentioned with procurement, you want to do some reverse engineering. You want to be scientific about your procurement and, you know, be sure that you're kind of spreading the um, the items through various different price levels um, and making sure that there's some appealing things for every single donor at the event. Um, individual and special item strategies. What I meant by this was we, and I'll tell a little tiny story here. I'll try to make it, make it brief, but um, we were at our raise conference last year, best conference, really one of the only conferences out there that focuses solely on event and campaign planning strategies. Um, so we were at the raise conference and I was lucky enough to speak to one of our long-term customers and she made a comment. Um, we were talking about how to create really great live auction items. And she made a comment that, um, and donation appeal too. Uh, she said that she didn't feel like they had a great mission. You know, she didn't feel like it was something that, that resonated with people. So we kind of dug into some of her programming and it ended up they're a theater and, and they host um, summer camps for, for kids that, um, you know, whose parents can't afford the camps and they are, uh, you know, donated these camp um, to, to go to camp for the summer. Um, so we, so we kind of talked about that. And then we also talked about the fact that she has an actual physical location so if you have something like that, you have a physical location where you can create something really, really special that no one can go out and buy. No one can go out and buy, you know, a little girl's birthday party sleepover at the dance theater. And maybe there's some ballerinas there, um, you know, thinking along those lines of really creating something very special and um, very specific to your cause. Um, specifically when you have a physical location. So that's one example. Um, there's a lot of other things you can do too with networking um, through your sponsors and things like that. You might be able to get some really nice items. I, I remember there was an, a customer that was able to get a lunch with a bank president in one of the cities that we worked in. So, you know, something you can't go out and buy, you can't get in touch with this person to ask them to go to lunch for the most part. So thinking along those lines, how can you be creative? How can you use your connections? And then how can you take, if you do have a physical location, um, and get really creative about what types of live auction items you can offer? Great. Thanks for covering that procurement. Jason, I'm going to open it up to you. We had Melissa talked about auction teams. Uh, we talked about procurement, early planning, budgeting, and goals. What is your pro tip at this early stage? Um, definitely. And those are all great tips to have and to dive in a little deeper on the procurement. I definitely would try to start working six to eight months in advance um, procuring items so you can have those tent pole items in your live and your silent. And then another thing about your team, and yes, it is true, Melissa, that you have to have an amazing team to pull this off. One thing that I found very helpful when I run auction teams is I've broken them into groups. And I've taken five people here, five people there, five people here, and I've put them in a group and say, okay, you work on health and beauty products. Go find the yoga lessons. Go find uh, Botox. Go find teeth whitening. All of that type of stuff. And then let's compile that into some really cool packages. And then I would deal with somebody and say, let's find some travel. And then go and call it. So if you found a trip in San Diego, find the paddleboarding company. Find the brewing company. Find the um, great zoo tickets. 
get that and build it and build it as a team. One, it gives your your committee real responsibility and they're not willy nilly trying to pull together a lot of stuff and they have a great focus and they feel like they're really part of the event at that point because they were able to produce something amazing. As far as special items and strategies, that's one of our biggest things that we try to do for every one of our clients at Winspire is I can take any of our packages that we have and modify them to fit the needs that would speak directly to your mission or we can create something completely new that would be mission centric for you all. So definitely feel free to reach out with any of that. Those are some of my best tips to give with this. Excellent. Um, before we jump in, I want to get you, you made me think about something, you know, these tent pole, these big experience items, these one of a kinds, as Melissa talked about, I, I'm going to give you a tip out there, something that I use. There's high competition for these things if you're trying to get them donated. So how do you stand out to make sure you get that donation next year? Personalize your follow up with that sponsor. So I would get quotes from the people who took these trips or had a one of a kind of experience, get them to send you pictures, um, get them to talk about how important it was and craft something for the sponsors and follow up right after the event. Thank you for helping donate this that $5,000 did this. And here's what Melissa said, how much she enjoyed your experience. Um, but if you can get those experiences to come back year over year, you really get yourself uh, much further along in both your budgeting and your goals. So let's jump into the next one. <clears throat> Fundraising strategy. Uh so this is revenue streams and nine to six months out with great fundraising strategies. Obviously, we're all going to have a silent auction. You know, my my preference of a silent auction is a good 75 to 100 items that are impactful, that have great meaning to those and have a couple of items within those. So if it is a date night, there's a dinner certificate, there's a nail certificate, there's a massage certificate, and poten potentially a limo ride to create that really unique experience. Um, fund a need. I can't talk about how amazing it is to have a solid fund a need because this is direct money in the organization's pocket. There was no hard work in a sense that you had to procure items or find a venue or pick the caterer. This is pulling the heartstrings. So always make sure that you have videos, audio, testimonials that you can share during that time and have someone that can speak that mission deeply. I'm going to shock a lot of you when I say this, but I do not think that it should be the executive director doing the fund to need. I believe that you should have a third party or a person of interest on the board that does it. The executive director's job is every day asking for money. They know you're going to ask them for money, so don't ask them at the event. Go and enjoy your donors and have a good time with them. Um, live auction, you know, my rule is five to seven items at max. You lose attention of a crowd if you don't have that. If you have more than that, you start to lose attention. So make those items really special and make sure that those items, not only could they be completely donated, but items that you potentially could sell two and three times because you're leaving money on the table if it was one time and you have a room of 400 people. Um, ticketing, make sure you get your tickets out there early. Pull your list from your mobile bidding from the years before attendees. Send them an uh, email six to eight months in advance and give them a discount of buying tickets early. Um, sponsorships, the same thing. Reach out to your sponsors from last year and talk to them about what they want. And then, of course, fixed prices and raffles. You know, fixed prices are really hot right now when you can able to get a multiple of items, definitely go with something like that. And raffles, check your rules in your state, make sure that it could either be a raffle or a game of chance, or you have to give a physical item, make sure that you check that. Next slide, please. So my pro tip was start early on sponsorships and get creative with benefits. And when I say get creative with benefits, talk to your sponsors after your event from the year before and say, what is it that you want? What do you like about our event? What did you find interesting and what did you get from this? You know, they may come to the table and say, you know what, we really want our logo on the cupcakes this next year. It's a great way to put them out there. Um, what if you included a trip within their uh, sponsorship package? 
as a creative sponsorship or a creative director, you're going to turn around and say, this trip was in there. It's amazing for you all. But if you donated it back to us, I can take that money that you just gave us and double that with putting it in the live auction. And then your items are underwritten. So always check that, but get creative with benefits. I saw something uh, not too long ago at a conference where it was in the men's restroom. There was a urinal cake with the logo of an organization and it was super creative because people went after and went and talked to them. So it was just get creative. Think about maybe putting their banners on the staircase going up to the ballroom um, or hanging banners within the cocktail hour. There's many ways that you can do this that are outside the box. That's my tips. Excellent. Melissa, what do you add anything quickly on uh, on sponsorship? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Jason's ideas are amazing, and I think the more creative you can get, the more appealing your sponsorship packages are. Um, and I, again, would just focus on really that corporate good aspect, um, really be able to lay out for somebody to show them not only the type of billing they're going to get at the event, but what types of messaging you're going to send regarding that sponsor. Will you weave them into social posts? Will you weave them into email sends um, talking about the event? You know, I've um, suggested for some people really making their, as they upload their auction items, making that kind of a fun, again, I'm spoiling my next slide, but um, <laughs> making a kind of a fun, um, you know, we've uploaded five new items today and these items have been sponsored by, you know, ABC Corporation, who's one of our, you know, valuable sponsors. Um, so think about ways you can weave them into your communications and then share that story with them about how much you're going to connect them with this great mission um, and really make them a part of the event and your fundraising in this time period. Great. I'd also add real quick on the sponsorship as creative, um, both Melissa and Jason have hit on it. This early out when you're, you know, kind of in these semi early planning stages and you're thinking about your sponsorships, think about what digital visibility I can give my sponsors and what physical visibility I can give my sponsors. You can monetize so many aspects of your event. It can be physical, as Jason said, staircase, you know, go walk your venue, think about all the way, creative ways you can help our brand stand out and think about digital, online, your social media, as Melissa pointed out, um, your mobile bidding software, scoreboards at the event. But both of those should be elements of your sponsorship packages. Yep, great. All right, let's go next. Okay. Um, so we're talking about auction promotion, um, about four to two months out, <laughs> two to four months out uh, from your auction. This is really the time you want to dial up your promotion. So this takes a little bit of strategy, right? You have to have a good standard on, you know, do you, have you procured a lot of your items? This all, all of this stuff is interconnected, right? This is why you need that great team. You need that great strategy in the beginning. You need to lay the foundation so that as you move through these stages, you're fully prepared to take those next steps. So here, you want to have a good amount of your items procured, price, details out, pictures uploaded, so that if you are using, you know, our software or something, you know, similar, that you are able to post pictures. You are able to identify your donors online. Um, create hashtags, have all of those things worked out so that as you start to post items, um, if you want to publish those to your to your donors, you have something to talk about, right? And you have the, the meat behind what you want to represent for each of those items. Um, we also talk about, um, you know, ticket sales and pre-event revenue. Um, we always find our most successful customers utilize our software in the way that it was intended. So using the software for ticket sales automatically gets your donors to pre-register because they need to buy their ticket. So that helps you create this really nice, easy check-in process on site. All of these things are interconnected. So make sure as you make decisions that those decisions are going to lead to success at each phase. Um, Pre-event revenue as far as um, advertising your items beforehand. I talked a little bit about creating social media campaigns, recognizing all of the special items that you're attaining, all of the hard work you're your um, volunteers and staff members are doing and you know give them a little bit of praise and thanks in your social posting create a story about how you guys are planning this event um, there's a lot of um, new data out there showing um, organizations that spread their social footprint instagram stories you know facebook live videos um, 
you know, Twitter, Twitter postings with hashtags and pictures of your items. There are all these little things that you can do in different platforms um, to really create this story that your donors and guests can follow along with. Um, we talked about ticket sales. It makes so much sense to sell tickets, get people to register early online, get them engaged in your online auction. Um, anytime we're asked, I know on the team, anytime we're asked, well, should I just wait until the day before to publish my auction? Absolutely not. Publish that as early as you can. Make some social posts about as items get uploaded. Create some, you know, fanfare around it. Make it fun and make it interesting for people that they want to keep checking the site and see what you've got and start that early bidding. Um, and launch online auction, which I just talked about. Um, so I think um, if we can just move to the pro tip, um, you know, I kind of talked a little bit already about marketing strategies, and I do think it's super, super important to really refine what your messaging is, what story you want to share, and how much visibility do you want to give your guests into the making of the event. I'm sure there's a case for being mysterious about it, right? Maybe that would be kind of a fun idea, just being real mysterious about what the event's about, what the theme is. Um, you could do things like that as well. So whichever way you decide, um, just pick a strategy and then create the culture that goes around with that. Um, I mentioned ambassador fundraising in the very beginning of the presentation. And ambassador fundraising to me, it's sort of like the compound interest of the banking world, of the nonprofit world, excuse me, because it basically takes your donors' connections, your most ardent supporters, and magnifies them so that they are bringing their personal networks to your organization, sharing your mission, and making it super easy with technology for people to give. Um, so I definitely implore everybody on the call to really look into ambassador fundraising. We've got a ton of information on our website um, and start considering ways that you can really connect with your, your most loyal supporters and have them help you fundraise. Thanks, Melissa. Jason, I'm going to um, have you jump in in just a second. I, I do want to play off of something that Melissa had in her list. She talked about the interconnectivity between um, promotion and ticket sales and pre-event revenue and online auctions. I don't have the data for 20, 2020 yet because it's super early, but we know that in 2020, 2019, last year, people were going out with their auctions more than 30 days ahead of time. And, and they don't have to have a full auction at this point, people. You can dribble items out there you can get them but but get your ticket sales out there ticket sales were something like 40 plus days ahead of the event get your ticket sales out there start putting items getting people as they said to buy those tickets then they see items they start bidding you've got revenue coming in um, and you're building a base for what will uh, compound as melissa said once you get to the event jason what pro tip real quick would you like to share here yeah, definitely the marketing strategies, those are key. Getting to the market early, getting people interested, getting them to know what's going on. And I totally agree with um, doing some posts around your items. We are at Winspire doing our best this year to add in social media posts to every one of our packages that with raw images that the organization can use in their post along with a blurb that goes along with it where you can put in your hashtag and you can name your organization. Just trying to help you guys all the way through the process to give you the best tips and success that we've seen from around the world um, you know and it's just like you said you don't have to go online with a full auction go on with some items and then send an update two weeks later with an email saying we've added new items you don't have to tell them what you've added you just added some new items and they're going to go and start browsing through it so I eventually kind of like with any other marketing, once you see something about three times, you're going to pay attention to it. So I may want to buy that drill after I've seen it the third time. Not likely, but you never know. <laughs> All right, let's cruise to the next tip. Awesome. This is two to a month out from the event, execution planning. And I cannot stress enough um, with the events that I've done in my career from 11,000 person on a one weekend to a 30 person board dinner. Um, have your run a show, do your walk through, do a setup with your floor plan and run your check in and check out. There are so many things that could go wrong last minute, but the more that you work through it and have these details down online, the better you're going to be. Um, keeping that short, let's move on to the next slide and I can share my tip. Um, my tip is practice, practice, 
practice. Um, I don't care if the ballroom is set up fully, act like that you are walking from backstage to walk on stage and walk through your speech, walk through your announcements, you know, have someone read anybody else's speech that was there, time it. Make sure that your timing is down, how you're hitting it, your cues of your music. Make sure that you practice this. Take Legos and make your floor plan. Make sure that you can walk between the tables and they're comfortable. Make sure that your centerpieces are at a level if you have a professional auctioneer can see the back of the room. Um, I love the 20s galas that we have coming out this year. Plumes are my best friend that is in my house, but you need to be able to see the entire room when you're working on stage for your donation appeal and your live auction. So make sure that you practice these things because it's just like gymnastics. It will become muscle memory and you will have less surprises the night of. That's it. I, I don't think you can underemphasize the practice, practice, practice makes perfect. I think you know, for a lot of us, Jason, Melissa, myself, who've done fundraising for years, um, you know, you can be guilty of walking into your event and been like, oh, it's the same as it was last year. Nothing's ever the same in that ever. organic format. And so, you know, be overly assertive in your practicing and asking everybody else to practice too. Melissa, anything you want to add to this? And then we'll cruise into kind of the home stretch of our webinar here. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Kelly, that you can't practice enough. You can't set your volunteers up enough. Um, we have a lot of great resources here that we can send out to volunteers or, or you know, you can send out. We have um, some volunteer training videos. We actually just recently had a customer um, who the event manager um, had commented to me, wow, I, I worked this event last year and the volunteers were like really confused and hadn't prepared well and, and you know, didn't watch any of the videos. And, and it showed at, at registration, you know, it showed to the donors and it showed to the staff on site. Um, and this year they made a, a training plan. They actually sent out some instructions to their team. They sent out our training video prior to the event. And the event manager said it was night and day between the last event and this event. So, you know, real, I love real life stories. I feel like they're, they're so impactful. And I think, you know, just really, really checking off all of these boxes and almost annoy people with how well prepared they will be that would be my my one <laughs> piece of advice like on that one <laughs> yeah. you know what i'm saying like yep. really just literally like get on their nerves because you've prepared them so well they're like yes i know i know i understand um and that's how your volunteer should be like that they're sick of hearing from you about what they'll be doing on event day um because I, I i unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately i can count on more than both hands the times when I've been at an event and the volunteers have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. There's no captain. There's no, you know, um, no plan. So definitely I want a plan. hundred percent. You know, when we talk about this, we talked about it last year a lot. And then it, I think it's even becoming like, it, you know, you, there's like these little ideas and then they become part of the mainstream culture the next year. If it's not yeah. the year of the donor experience this year, I don't know when it ever will be. And you hear nonprofits <laughs> talk about things like, volunteer registration you know because you're creating an experience it's not a transaction uh they can have a transaction yeah. anywhere they can go to amazon and have a transaction if they're supporting your cause you want to give them a great experience so think about this in your practice when you practice 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 through the eyes of your attendees and experience your event every aspect of it like would this be a great experience or would it really annoy me because chances are if it annoys you it's going to annoy them 10 times and if you like it they're going to like it. Absolutely. I so, I so agree. And, you know, back to my point from before, um, it, this all rides upon you being prepared and having all of the important things done before the event so that those couple days before the event, you're focused solely on your volunteers and that wonderful check-in and check-out experience, which tend to be the trouble spots, I would say, for many of our customers. Um, you know, that's like the pitfalls. So, get those things nailed down, get them really, really dialed in, and you're gonna provide, as Kelly said, you know, a non-annoying experience, <laughs> a great experience for your donor. Excellent, let's move into this uh, next one real quick. Okay, so we're at the big day, um, T minus zero. Uh, this is the day, um, I will say, um, load and set up, you know, one of the one of the challenges on event day is, of course, our nonprofit fundraisers have worked so hard, and all the volunteers and staff have worked so hard, 
and you know they want to they want to get dolled up that day they want to put on their fancy dresses and have their makeup done maybe and you know really prepare um i will say that you know make sure that happens absolutely you deserve that self care those self care moments um and to feel great at the event so that you come out you know at your best um but to make sure you're making time to button up those final details on event day that you make time you know for us we always want our event manager to meet with the customer beforehand. Let's review the run of show. Let's go over all of these details so that we're so, everybody's so well informed that everyone knows what to do in almost any situation. And if not, you've assigned someone that's gonna keep track of that throughout the whole event and be a captain at each important area that your donor is going to visit. Um, so this plays in uh, greatly with number two, dry running and checking. Dry run should be happening Definitely do a volunteer dry run, as I mentioned, check in and check out or some of those problem areas. Get that really dialed in. Make sure that they know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. What is What are the talk tracks? What do we do if someone doesn't have a paddle? What do, um, you know, what if someone comes in that doesn't have a ticket? Have all these things planned out, all of those questions that might come up. And as Kelly said before, put yourself in your donor's shoes, right? Make it a really nice appealing experience for them. They should be welcomed warmly. They should get the information that and then they should walk away and go and enjoy the event. The event. So don't let people linger. Um, event producers, people that really are going to stay there and follow the run of show. So make sure somebody's responsible for that. Someone that is empowered, right? You want someone that can make decisions in your absence. So make sure you kind of get that right-hand person, whether it's a third party or someone on your staff. Empower the people around you. Trust them to do the right thing and obviously prepare and inform them beforehand. Um, volunteer assignments. This is more crucial than you know. Um, so obviously being purveyors of, of technology, um, you know, volunteers do run our technology on event day and it's very user friendly. But if you have someone at, at registration that's never used an iPad, it's not going to be user friendly for them <laughs> because they don't understand, you know, the way to touch a touch device um, or maybe they, they you know, a, a variety of different things can happen. So be sure that you have the most tech savvy volunteers, people that use touch technology every day, people that have a technical mind that, you know, are in, in and out of technology all day long. Uh, check in using technology is not the place to put, you know, your 90 year old grandmother that's lovely and, and you know, <laughs> loves to be at these events. That's probably not the right place to put her. Um, so think about that, right? Take people's talents and put them in the appropriate places. Um, and then scheduled communication, so, so important. We have been at events where the auctioneer actually didn't know what the plans were. Um, so make sure that everyone involved has a copy of the run of show or has a specific section that relates just to their efforts that's on that day and that they know exactly what's going to happen um, and they know exactly what's going to be communicated. Make sure you have a great plan, again, using technology, you have the ability to send text messages, plan those beforehand or, you know, lean on your event manager, trust in them to take that on for you, um, to send, you know, meaningful um, brief messages to encourage people, you know, to bid or when the auction's going to end or things like that. That's great. Let's go ahead and go into this pro tip. Um, and then I want to make sure we save time. We've got one more. Jason's going to knock it out of the park at the end of this. And then we're going to go into questions. So we got a lot of questions in the question bar. Okay, perfect. I love questions. Um, well, again, I've spoiled my pro tip slide, but um, we talked about the run of show document, make sure everything's really, really planned out, that everyone knows where they're supposed to be, who's in charge, who's empowered to make decisions, and, um, you know, get that written down. Um, have a team meeting, all right? I've suggested to have a, a volunteer training and meeting a few days before your event. On the day of, let's get everybody together in a group. Make sure you have, you know, your clipboard with printouts that everybody can have. Maybe you put some cell phone numbers on there. Make sure that you have a plan in, in place because if there's anything for sure, it's that something will go wrong, right? Something's going to go wrong. Something's going to happen. But if you have plans in place for those types of things, everyone will be clearer minded, much less stressed, and know that they have, you know, a specific thing that they need to do there that they're responsible for. And we talked about registration and checkout, common areas for pitfalls at nonprofit events. Just make sure you have a great plan. And make sure your people aren't um, have it over imbibed, and that they are willing and ready to do the job at the end of the night, which which is challenging, right? You're tired. You've been there all day. Make sure we refresh them somehow. Maybe there's a coffee bar or some special desserts just for the volunteers to, 
you know, get their energy back up and, and get the final, the last impression that your donor gets to make that really, really special and a nice experience. Great. Jason, anything you, any pro tip you want to share before we have you close it out with your fabulous event mindset? Um, definitely. You know, staffing is very important. And I always, yes, a captain for each team and each location. But, you know, think of the things that you don't think of. What is one thing that people ask for really the most at an event is where's the bathroom? Have everybody have a volunteer at every ballroom door that when somebody walks out and they say where the bathroom is, they know exactly where it is. That is the quickest way to make somebody happy and the fastest to, to, to win them over. Um, but have an expert. Always have an expert as one of your captains that is the technology expert. If there's some problem, send them to them. If there's a person without a ticket, send them to this person. If it's somebody that's got questions about the auction, send them to this person. Always have a captain, an experienced person that can handle something and make an authoritative decision. I think that that is, uh, all those tips are great. And I would say something that Melissa said is, you know, something will always go wrong. I would always, with my teams, I would say something unforeseen will always happen. What separates us is how we solve it. Um, so that everybody goes in with the mindset that something's going to blow up, something's going to happen. And that's expected. It's what we do to solve it that makes the difference. Yeah. Okay. Let's, Absolutely. Uh, Jason, Jason, let's round you out uh, and then let's try to see if we can save a few minutes for questions. Can I probably have about 40 questions, believe it or not? Awesome. <laughs> so auction day mindset. We all know we go in with this mindset of that we're going to kill it and this is going to be the best event ever. And then three hours into it, you're dragging and you can't make it work and you don't know what's happened. And you're like, why is it all falling apart? So my best tips for this is have a pump up playlist have music going during setup for your volunteers and things like that because you know the music makes the heart sing and it makes the body move and when people are moving and having a good time and laughing and cracking up it's going to go so much smoother and so much faster um anybody that's in the head of an event planning position and even your volunteers i suggest a 10 to 15 minute moment of silence in the corner by yourself at least once an hour because it gives your time to reset your brain it gives you a minute to blow off whatever that flower didn't show up and get in the arrangement or get your mindset just ready to be back and focused and be that person so have that moment of silence just to breathe and take your time um your survival bag i call this your drag bag so always have an extra bag with an extra black dress your ballet slippers, an extra tube of lipstick, some hair dressings, anything else that you need, have an extra bag, keep it with you because as much as we all love and think that we're gonna be able to run back up to the room and change clothes and freshen up, 99% of the time that doesn't happen. So have your drag bag with you, have a protein bar in there and that rolls right into hydrate. Make sure you have water for yourself and for your volunteers. Don't make them go struggling to go find a water fountain. Have a case of water sitting out. Make sure that everybody is drinking it. Um, overstaff your volunteers. This kind of goes on the point that we were talking about a little bit ago. I would rather have volunteers standing by the bathroom door, checking it every time somebody leaves to make sure there's toilet paper, hand towels, soap, whatever it is. Make sure that you have somebody that's got a little flag that can walk around on their back with tech questions. You can name them the geek and have them in the crowd asking questions about if they're doing their mobile bidding properly. Have so much volunteer staff that it becomes ridiculous and you're over it, but you have so many people there that can jump in at any time and help. Um, and always have a backup plan. I am notorious for planning in a beautiful event outside and it will start to rain. So make sure you have a backup plan of an audio, a visual, anything like that, or have someone that you know that you could depend on that could jump out of that audience and take over that crowd at the moment if you're having some difficulties and win them back around and get that going. So self-care, music, hydrate, You'll kill this. 2020 is going to be an awesome year for fundraising. We look forward to helping all of you guys. And I know this is going to be an amazing year. So go, go, go and good luck. Make it work. $50 is $50.
<laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. So let's go ahead and, and cruise through the last slides, Blair, and then I want to give people just a chance to ask some questions. I've been writing questions down as they come in. Um, why don't we go ahead and cruise to the bonus slides and, so we can get those out of the way. Uh, we will be sending in our follow-up email uh, a link to our auction event day survival kit. This covers a lot of the tips that we um, went through today, as well as special bonus content coming from Winspire. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, what did you put together for everybody on this webinar? I created an awesome Spotify playlist that I expect when I come to a gala, I walk in, I better hear this pumping. And you got from Queen to Journey to Kelly Clarkson to Pink, you got a little bit of everything in there that can really make the, make the day go by faster. Excellent. And then as Melissa said, you know, visit us on onecause.com. I know we had a couple questions out there about online auctions. Um, go to onecause.com, go to our resources page, just search on online auctions. You'll find a ton of stuff out there, a ton of best practices. Also, Winspire's um, website, they've got a ton of great resources as well. And so with that, I'm going to just jump into questions. And first, I'm going to ask, answer a couple up front, Jason and Melissa, and then I'm going to turn to each of you. Uh, we had a couple of questions on the stats, event donor stats at the beginning. How recent were they? Um, we put that study out in the last year. Again, you can go to onecause.com and, and search on social donor, uh, but all those stats of the 1,056 event donors are very new. Um, I have a, a question for Jason. Somebody wants to know, you made a tip about how to leverage sponsors for underwriting, something about using a trip. Uh, we have somebody who wants you just to explain that really quickly in a little bit more detail. Perfect. So what you can do is include some experiences that you may have had donated or of a consignment level um, to your donors at different levels. So if you have a $100,000 sponsorship, obviously it should be like a package that you could include for four to six people that would be traveling or things like that. Once they agree to doing the $100,000 sponsorship, they found that package amazing. You as that salesperson for the organization, your development directors, you know, obviously you're gonna be calling them and thanking them for them. In that same conversation say, if I could have that trip donated back to me from that hundred thousand dollar sponsorship that you did i could potentially turn that into a hundred and twenty thousand dollar sponsorship because it's underwritten and it's going to be on stage and we can have it as a live auction so think of creative ways like that to weave in experiences not just promotion and not just things like that something physical um someone can get because they love that established small businesses and large corporate donors Great. And I say, if you get yourself a $100,000 sponsor, you better take that trip because <laughs> that is amazing. Um, we had a question, Melissa, this is for you. How much before the event should you open the auction online? Yeah. Um, you know, it really depends on the event, the number of items. So there's kind of not a, a catch-all answer. Um, if I had to, to set one, I would say at least four to six weeks before the event, um, but even two weeks is, is a nice um, is a nice time to open that up. And it really depends on your group. I feel like schools um, have very captive audiences, so for those folks, you may want to give them a little bit more time um, to look to look through the items um, and like for for the high demand items for those sort sort of customers that we have, like the parking spots and things like that. Um, that will give people time to get in there and set their bids. And I also would encourage your donors to set maximum bids. Um, we have many people that have, have gone way beyond, you know, revenue numbers they thought they could get just because there's a, a, a maximum bid set and it automatically bids against any other bidder, really driving up revenue for individual items. So that's also something I would advertise um, in all of your marketing, you know, don't forget, get in early. And if you want, you can just set it and forget it through a maximum bid. Um, so great. I definitely use that tool. Yeah. Jason, a question for you from earlier. What was the rec recommended number of auction items? Uh, you mentioned this early on and somebody wants you to clarify. From me, is that my question yeah. um, mm -hmm. of silent auction? So silent. silent auction, you know, depending on the attending list of what you're looking at, if you're looking at it, 150 person an event, I mean, I would have probably 40 to 55 items. If you're looking at over 150, 75 is a good number because it gives you a great range of product from travel to health and beauty to concerts to you know personal experiences, things like that. But I would keep it in the 75 to 
90 range, I think that's a good selection because you got to remember you have about 15 seconds as someone is walking down that line looking at those items to grab their attention with what you've got going on. So yeah. just keep it concise, keep it tight, do a cute display, and you'll be able to win every time. Absolutely. Our stats are shown smaller than new black too, right? I mean, everybody's going to smaller, smaller auctions. Yep. Oh, we're not <clears throat> seeing these 200, 300 auction items. Um, we're seeing packages, uh, smaller, tighter tables. Okay, real quick. Um, Cindy, I didn't forget about you. Ambassador Fundraising, what I'm going to recommend in the interest of time is go to onecause.com, search on Ambassador Fundraising. There's eBooks, blogs, success stories, everything you need to know about what that is um, and how it helps your fundraising. Let's see. Okay. Is this one says I have multiple events per year. Should auctions, multiple auctions per year, should I be advertising my auctions at one time in one communication strategy? I feel like I'm over tapping into my audience um, by telling about, about all the different auctions at different times. Anybody want to take that? Um, you know, I think Yes, there's that catch 22. Did the chicken come first or the egg come first? And who are you hitting and how many times are you hitting with people? And do you overwhelm them and do you not overwhelm them? You know, I, I look at PR as PR and marketing materials and opportunity to be in front of somebody is always a great way to continue to remind them. So I would try to keep it singular focused of what event that it is, because you may draw different crowds for those, but try to keep it singularly focused um, on what event you're trying to promote and what auction you're doing. Okay, great. Uh, okay, Melissa and Jason, we have, I'm going to throw out a challenge for you. We have about 20 questions to try to cover in five minutes. Do it. And so <laughs> I'm going to tell you sh super short answers. Here we go. Speed question. What's the best way of procuring donated items? Is email standard or do you recommend calling, calling. In, in person? Calling. Melissa? Yeah, I would say calling or in person is probably better than email. Got it. What are your tips for the most efficient check-in process with one cause software? Well, we could do a whole webinar on that. Uh, <laughs> I would say my recommendation. Sell your ticket. Sell your yeah. tickets uh, online. I mean, yeah. it makes things so much easier for check-in. Yeah. Sell your tickets online, have the right volunteers there. Um, also yep. go to onecause.com and go to our webinars. We did an exact webinar on this last year with um, Corporate Giving Connection. Yep. Um, can you send the link for One Cause trainings? I will have Melissa reach out to you, Victoria. Uh, what do you recommend for gathering guest payment before the auction? Uh, sell tickets online. Yep. But anything else, <laughs> Melissa? Yeah, sell tickets online. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah, they're going to have to enter their credit card number. It's going to have to be uh, accurate, and that's how you get the most accurate information. So, and that's really what we we're also seeing. have covered. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say we have covered costs now too, so someone can opt in to cover some of the costs associated with credit card processing fees and things like that. So that's a second reason why it's nice to sell tickets online, have them register. They'll be able to opt in to cover costs uh, for that transaction. And we're seeing a ton of donors take advantage of that. They, they'll they cover the $3 ticket fee or whatever the percentage is um, for you. I would say sell online if you want to cut down um, people waiting when they get to the event. Uh, yeah. How can I encourage my volunteers to volunteer for an event when some of them are also our donors and want to enjoy the event? Ooh, that's a good that's question. A <laughs> That is a tough one. I, you know, I, I always tap into any kind of local fraternity, sororities, Kiwanis clubs, anything like yeah. that has a group that does socially conscious activities. I would definitely tap into them first to see if you're volunteers. And if it just comes down to it and you really need them, ask them and say, look, could you work the door for the first hour and a half and then go join the event? Mm -hmm. Or refer me to one of your friends that might be able to help out. Yeah, you know, you absolutely. can ask them for a referral. And then last thing I would mention is volunteer spot and sign up genius. Put it out there, ask your volunteers and your staff members to share. There are people that will volunteer that aren't connected with your event. And you know what, in the future, they most likely become a donor. <laughs> I think we found that in one of our studies that people that volunteer are more likely to become a donor. So Jason, this question's for you. Jody wants to know, when you're talking about a moment of silence, she says 15 seconds, not 15 minutes, right? She doesn't uh, have 15 no, minutes. No, Jody. <laughs> uh, you need at least 
10 minutes for your brain to relax and rewire your body. So I know that sounds like there's a lot, but think about if you went to the restroom, that's gonna take you four to seven minutes to start with. So use that time. You know, any time that you can make in, that you can step away for 10 minutes, close your eyes, stand in a corner and just be quiet, that's when you're gonna have the most successful day. Okay, um, okay, we've got four minutes to cover 10 questions. Uh, Melissa, do you plan to buy her for big ticket items as a backup security blanket in your live auction? It can't hurt. <laughs> can't hurt. It's always nice to have a plant, uh, both in the donation appeal as well as um, somebody that is going to buy a live auction. I've had customers say to me, I know who's buying every live auction item that I have. So some people do like to plan down to that level. Go ahead, Jason. This is your area. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I mean, we always suggest when it is a very high ticket item that comes in is to reach out to your high dollar donors that were there the year before and even put out a survey with your customers and say, you know, would if we had these items, would you be interested in them? And then that helps you rank where they should be in the order of giving them out and then also just being able to touch the base with the donors prior to coming to the event of, hey, we have something that you probably be would interested in and we can work this out for you. I mean, always just it's it's communication we all talk about this communication 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 stay in touch with your donors keep them informed with what is going on because that's the way that you're going to have some slam dunks and really awesome sales awesome okay um unfortunately i don't think we're going to get to all of the questions um because they keep coming in which is great but i might send them to you Melissa and jason okay <laughs> are there any areas katie is going to pose you the stumper are there any areas where you can cut out volunteers to make room for volunteers in another area <sighs> melissa i'll let you take that one <laughs> yeah i'm not sure i understand fully the question um where, are you, you asking trim an area? I think what she's asking is, can you trim an area? Is there any, have you seen anybody get rid of a volunteer area? Um, she's already posed the question, I don't have a lot of volunteers. Um, so yeah. it's hard to overstaff when I can barely get things staffed as it is. So, yeah, well, hopefully you wrote down some of the resources we talked about. Jason talked about sororities, fraternities, athletic teams from local universities. I've done events. I used to live in North Carolina. You know, we did events with the Duke football team which, you know, is kind of nice, too, for the, the um, donors like to interact with, with the athletes. Um, so that's a great idea. Um, but aside from that, you know, a lot of people, um, even still nowadays, although it's reduced a lot, are still a little nervous about um, maybe an older demographic being able to use the, the mobile bidding product, um, get into the app and, and be able to use it. Um, so I would say that that really doesn't exist so much anymore. There's, it's very user friendly and most people are on cell phones um, daily. So I would probably say that would be one area that you could really reduce the number of people. A lot of um, our customers would like to have like volunteers in the auction area to be there as like a resource, but I find they end up standing around most of the night. And if someone needs help, you could always staff one person at a specific location. Um, so that would be one area I could say you would get rid of. For me, the most important area to have volunteers is check in and check out. Yeah. <laughs> um, other than that, and then obviously, um, you know, using the technology helps you get rid of the human capital that you need. So, you know, if you use the technology as it's intended, meaning use our donation appeal button, we have a way to send a donation right inside the mobile bidding tool. Um, use the scoreboards that recognize donors by name. Why involve a human component to it where there can be errors? Um, you need more bandwidth and people to, to support that. So keep using the technology and get deep into the each different component. Great. Okay, final question. Sorry, uh, Vanessa, Teddy, and um, Maya that we didn't get to yours. But Deb, you asked an 800 person event, really? Only 100 items? Yes, we're really seeing it. JDRF, uh, <laughs> a lot of big, these big nonprofits tightening up their auction tables and increasing the competitive bidding. I think I, the biggest event I saw last year had 125 items in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, ultimately, these are recommendations. and These are trends that we're seeing. If you feel like a larger auction works for you and it's not a total headache, then go for it. You mm -hmm. know, you know what works best for your donors. Um, we're, we're kind of sharing what we've seen trend wise. Um, and the trend is because to, to the person whose questions I just answered, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name, but, um, you know, people don't have endless supplies of volunteers to help them. They don't have 
you know, committees made up of, of 50 or 60 people to go out and procure 300 items. So if you have the support system to do that and you feel like that resonates with your donors, go for it. Excellent. Well, I know we went over, but all those questions are really important. Uh, Jason, Melissa, uh, Blair behind the scenes today, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for your tips on auction event survival. And as Jason said, $50 is $50. Let's go out and raise some money. Make it, make it <laughs> 2020. Excellent, everyone. Thank have you. A, have, have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.